Today, we're in chapter 34. Let's begin reading here in Ezekiel chapter 34 at verse 11. We'll read verses 11 through 16 in Ezekiel 34, and we'll get into our study. Ezekiel 34, beginning at verse 11, reading to verse 16. For thus says the Lord God, Indeed, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day he is among his scattered sheep, so will I seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they were scattered on a cloudy and dark day. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them to their own land. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, in the valleys, and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in good pasture, and their fold shall be on the high mountains of Israel. There they shall lie down in a good fold and feed in rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock, and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek what was lost and bring back what was driven away. Bind up the broken and strengthen what was sick. But I will destroy the fat and the strong and feed them in judgment. So, obviously, we need to go on diets. Um, as we look at this, let's remind ourselves that in the first 10 verses of chapter 34, that God has been speaking through Ezekiel, and he's made it clear that he's opposed. He's opposed to the false shepherds there in the nation of Israel. The leadership of the nation has failed to lead the people in a proper fashion. They have failed to lead, even as we saw in verses 1 through 10, they failed to lead in love. They failed to lead uh, with concern, and this includes all the leadership. It would include the kings. It would include the priests. It especially was speaking of the prophets and those who are referred to in Scripture as the false prophets. They had basically been more concerned with their own well-being. They were self-satisfied and arrogant. They were selfish. And as a result of that, God, as he has seen the way they have neglected and treated his people, God has stated that he was against these shepherds. Notice in verse 10, remind yourself of what he said there when he said, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand. I will cause them to cease feeding the sheep, and the shepherds shall feed themselves no more. For I will deliver my flock from their mouths, that they may no longer be food for them. So the false shepherds, the false leadership was more concerned with their own well-being, with their own needs, than they were for those whom they had been entrusted to care for. They were concerned with themselves, and God says, I'm against them. You see, in contrast to man's unfaithfulness, God is now, in the verses that we're about to look at, God is now proclaiming his own faithfulness. The human shepherds had no concern for the sheep. The human shepherds allowed the sheep actually to be injured. He had stated that in verse 8 when he said, My flock became a prey. My flock became food for every beast of the field because there was no shepherd. Nor did my shepherds search for my flock, but the shepherds fed themselves and did not feed my flock. And so the Lord has been speaking concerning the fact that he is faithful and, and those false shepherds are not. They've allowed these sheep to be hurt. So it's God who is speaking here, and it's God who is saying, I'm the one who recovers. God is saying, I'm the one who searches out. I'm the one who seeks uh, for my sheep. This is what it says throughout the Old Testament as it speaks concerning God being our shepherd. Remember in Isaiah, remember in chapter 40, verse 11, how it says, He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm, carry them in his bosom, gently lead those who are with young. And so that's what the Lord is simply saying here. He's saying there are false shepherds and there is the true shepherd. And he contrasts himself with the false. And he says, I'm going to be the one who searches you out. I'm the one who's going to seek for you, and I'm the one who will find you. Now, his sheep have been scattered, he says, in many places. They had been dispersed. We know that the Assyrians had come and had dispersed the, uh, the nation of Israel, the ten northern tribes. We know that. We also know that the Babylonians have taken uh, Jewish people into captivity. As a matter of fact, as we've been studying Ezekiel, we've seen that Ezekiel is actually one of the captives there in Babylon. And so God is saying that my sheep have been scattered in many places. And he said in verse 6, 
uh, of the same chapter. My sheep have wandered through all the mountains. My sheep have been scattered over the whole face of the earth. And so God speaks of his sheep as being lost. Again, in Jeremiah, in chapter 50, verse 6, he said, My people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds have led them astray. They have turned them away on the mountains. They've gone from mountain to hill. They have forgotten their resting place. And so what we have here is God saying, and notice again in verse 11, that he's going to search for and he's going to seek for his sheep. He's going to seek them out and find them. So what we have here is we have a picture of the seeking or the searching God. We also see a, a foretaste or a prefigurement. We have a, a glimpse, if you will, of the work of the Messiah. We also see a picture of the work of the church because God is portraying himself as a shepherd. Jesus Christ is a shepherd, and uh, we who are believers also do some of the things that a shepherd does. Now, remember that, that Jesus is the good shepherd who seeks out the sheep, and, and he's the one who cares for them. He said in John chapter 10, verse 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and am known by my own. So as we see this, we, one, have a picture of God, obviously, but two, we see Jesus Christ, our Messiah, as that good shepherd, as the one who seeks out the lost, the one who seeks until he finds them, which is what he did with us. Remember in Luke's gospel, when Jesus was speaking in chapter 15, you might want to turn there with me for just a moment, Luke chapter 15. Remember that story that Jesus gave there. It's found in verses 1 through 7, Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 7, to illustrate that Jesus, Messiah, is the shepherd who seeks out the lost. In Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 7, we read all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. The Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Jesus gave himself as an illustration of a shepherd who seeks out the lost. He was the shepherd who seeks out the lost sheep, even leaving 99 in order to find the one. And when he finds them, he says he carries them back as, as, as the shepherd carries that sheep. He brings them back and he rejoices over that sheep. Now, Jesus, by contrast to the false shepherds, is being uh, revealed to us as the one who cares. In the Old Testament, back in Ezekiel, if you'd like to turn back to Ezekiel 34, in the Old Testament, God is speaking of himself as being this shepherd who will seek out the sheep, but we see that fulfillment in the actual ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ who sought you out and sought me out. That's how you got saved. You know, so, so often I've heard over the years when people have given their testimonies, they've said several things, and then they will talk about what they at one time had done and what they had been and, and the kind of life that they at one time had lived. And, and then in their testimony, they'll say, and then I found God. Or, no, no, God wasn't lost. You know, God wasn't lost. You didn't find him. He found you. And that's what Jesus says. Jesus says, I'm like the shepherd who has one sheep who is lost, who leaves the others and goes out until he finds that one. And when he finds that one, then he returns with them rejoicing. And that's what the Lord did with you. That's what happened when you got saved. You were that sheep who has gone astray. Even as Isaiah said, we all like sheep have gone astray. And each one of us has gone his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So we went astray, we went our own way, but the Lord Jesus Christ sought us out. He, he was seeking for us until he found us, and, and then when he found us, he rejoiced over us. And so one, as you see this, you see a prefigurement of the Lord Jesus Christ, Messiah, who is the one who actually goes out looking for that lost sheep. And then secondly, you also see the work of the church. 
the body of Christ, which God has called us to do. This is really a prefigurement of future work that the church is going to participate in. Because we, as we are, we, when we are witnesses, when we are sharing what God has done in our life, when we, we give our testimony, if you will, when we give the gospel to people and encourage them to come to a, a, a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, we're acting out the role of uh, like a shepherd who is seeking out the lost. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be witnesses to me, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the furthest part of the earth. And so our responsibility is to, even as the good shepherd sought us out, it's our responsibility to also be willing to seek out others who are lost. When Paul was talking to the Thessalonians through his letter in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8, he said to this church, from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, which speaks of Greece, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. You have been faithful witnesses. The Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you have faithfully testified of the work that God has done. Now, in this room, we may not have many evangelists. It's been stated, I don't know if this is correct or not, but it's been stated that within the body of Christ, when it comes down to the gifts of the Spirit, probably around 10% or less actually have been called to be evangelists. You know, there are some that we know of by name, Billy Graham obviously being the most famous of them all, Luis Palau and others who are evangelists, who have that as a ministry, Greg Laurie, who have that as a ministry. That's what they do, and they do it well. But we have all, though we're not called spiritually through the gifting of evangelists, still we are all called to be witnesses. Every one of us has the ability to communicate what God has given to us. It's not difficult to do if we simply open our mouth. God said, if you open your mouth, I will fill it. Jesus said, I will give you words and wisdom that none of your uh, enemies will be able to gainsay nor resist. He said, when you're taken before councils, he said, it'll be the spirit of your father who speaks through you. Jesus said, if you obey my commands, he said, uh, my, my father and I will manifest ourselves to you. And so when you're there in that class or when you're there at the, at the dinner table this upcoming Friday with the family, and uh, somebody says, you know, we really, maybe we ought to pray over the meal. And they'll look around for somebody who's not as sinful as the rest. And they might look at you and say, hey, <laughs> you know, I'm too drunk to pray. Will you? You better not be drunk. But anyway, as they, as they say that, you have an opportunity. You have an opportunity not just in the prayer. I don't say evangelize in prayer, you know. Thank you, Lord, for this turkey. And speaking of turkeys, you know, Uncle Al over there is a, is a turkey. <laughs> you know, Jesus, make him a new creature. No, I, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, isn't it true, and you know it is, that God opens the door sometimes for you to share when you're with your family uh, on religious holidays, on Christmas or Easter or various times. And all you need to do is be willing to be that witness you know where our greatest problem is sometimes, guys? I think you'll agree with this. Those of you who give away your faith, I think you might understand this when I say it. Our greatest problem sometimes is really ourselves and false expectations. We're kind of like salespeople. We think if we don't close the sale, we failed. And so if they don't pray with us, then they, you know, we failed. And no, I, I don't believe that at all. I believe in sowing seeds. I believe that there are times that you can sow a seed and, and it, may, it may not come to any kind of fruition for months, weeks, or you know, years, or whatever time passes, uh, but you will be surprised. You will be surprised at what God can do. You know, just within the last week, I received a, a card. As a matter of fact, I need to respond, a, a business card. And it, I'm carrying it in my wallet right now. Yes, matter of fact, I might as well pull it out. I'll read, what, I'll read what he said. He gave me his name and uh, where he works and this and that. But on the other side, it says, Remember me, Fort Ord, A12. He goes, uh, You and Bill Solly led me to the Lord on a run in 1971. And, uh, of course, I remember him. His name was Larry. And... Uh, 
Larry came and visited our church. He, he didn't let me know he was here, else I'd have loved to have gone out there. He owes me $5. No, I'd, I'd have loved to have gone out and visited with him. Um, but you never know. You never know. I got out of the military December 15th, 1972. That's when I got out of the army. And Larry was led to Christ when I went into the military in March of 1971. And so for all of these years, you know, he obviously it took. Obviously, he began walking with the Lord. Obviously, all these years later, here he is visiting at this church, speaking to somebody via a card, and I will write him uh, via his email. Uh, but you never know. You never know. I, don't, I didn't remember it was on the run. I didn't remember that. I do remember Larry, and I do remember that he gave his heart to Christ. But that was in basic training. That's when I was 20 years old. That's when I was just a kid who didn't know anything other than uh, I was once blind and now I see. I was lost and now I'm found. I was only three years, three months old in the Lord when I went into the army. And so you can be used by God. You can be used if you open your mouth. You can be used by the Lord if you simply say, God, just, I want to be used by you. And that's what we're called to do. You see, God is saying here in Ezekiel, he's saying, I'm the shepherd. I will search for, I will seek out my lost sheep. The false prophets have led you into error. But I will be the one who goes out there and cares for you. They have cared only for themselves. And they have caused you to suffer hurt. But I won't do that to you. So not only is God that true and faithful shepherd, but he's, he's, he's prefiguring the fact that he, as Jesus Christ, our Messiah, is the one who seeks out the lost. And he's also reminding us that we too, who have come to faith in Christ, can go out and do the same. And so God is our great shepherd who does that kind of work. And, and as a shepherd, he's the one who does the work of seeking out those who are lost. Notice verse 12. He says, as a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day he is among his scattered sheep, so will I seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they were scattered on a cloudy and dark day. So as a true shepherd, God says, I search out and I find my sheep. Now, we're going to see this in context in just a moment. He does this in order to restore the nation of Israel to their land. This is the kingdom he's really speaking of that Messiah is ultimately going to lead. And I'll show you some things about that in a moment. But in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 3, he says, I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and bring them back to their folds. And they will be fruitful and increase." So God says, I'm going to search out and I'm going to find my lost sheep and I'm going to bring them back. Now notice verse 12, he speaks of the cloudy and dark day. Well, this speaks of the time of what is called Israel's national distress. It refers to their dispersion, how the nation of Israel had been dispersed or scattered throughout the world. And so he's speaking of this cloudy and dark day. In Jeremiah, again, in chapter 30, verses 4 through 7, these are the words that the Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah. Thus says the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask now and see whether a man is ever in labor with child. So why do I see every man with his hands on his loins like a woman in labor, and all faces turned pale? Alas, for that day is great. That, so that none is like it. It's the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. So he speaks of this national distress, this time of trouble that the nation has. And he says in verse 13, he says, I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries. I will bring them to their own land. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, in the, in the valleys and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in good pasture. Their fold shall be on the high mountains of Israel. There they shall lie down in good fold and, and feed in a rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. They will literally, and you need to note this, they will literally return to the land of Israel. They literally were in exile because of their sin. But in the future, God will literally bring them back to this nation. Just as there's a literal scattering, there will be a literal regathering. Now, there is, and, and this is the kind of uh, study that it's actually a little deeper than, than, than I'm used to giving in the sense that there's a lot of theology that I'm trying to 
make as plain as possible. One, so I can understand, and two, that I might communicate it well. But as we look at this, what you have in the history of Israel is a picture of the future. And what we're having here in chapter 34, ultimately, you'll see this perfectly, because uh, hopefully I'll have to, have to make it clear. But you're going to see this as, as a literal regathering of the nation in the last days. But during the history of Israel, remember with me for uh, just a moment, that, that the nation of Israel had been scattered. I already mentioned that the Assyrians had taken the ten northern tribes and scattered them. And then later on in the history of Israel, in 605 and two other times beyond that, through Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonians had come and had scattered the other two, the tribes of, of, of Judah uh, in, in the south. And uh, the ten northern were taken, and Judah, Benjamin, and the, and the south were taken. And what happened is the ten northern and two southern tribes ultimately were scattered. But in their history, they are also regathered. And it's like a foretaste or a preliminary uh, of what is going to take place in the latter days. When you study your Bible, you'll see things. If you take notes, you might want to note this. You'll see things in the book of Daniel, chapter 9 the book of Ezra, and the book of Nehemiah. And you'll see things that relate to a regathering. Now, the nation of Israel at the writing of Ezekiel is in Babylonian captivity. They're in Babylonian captivity. But somewhere around 538 B.C., they were given permission through Cyrus to return to their land. You see that kind of thing that is especially spoken of in the books that I mentioned earlier. Daniel in chapter 9 said that he was reading the scroll of Jeremiah and discovered that um, 70 years had been declared for them to be in captivity, and he knew that those 70 years were almost up. And so he began to see that God was about to, to bring them back from their captivity, bring them back to their land. When you study Ezra, when you study Nehemiah, you see the progressive restoration that took place in those books. And so that happened. And so the, the regathering, first, the foretaste of it, and keeping in context that Ezekiel is speaking of, is written in a time when they are in Babylonian captivity. It initially begins in around 538, but that's not the complete fulfillment of what is being written here in chapter 34. It's a demonstration of what God's future plan is. And that's going to take place later. You see another foretaste of that on the day of Pentecost. When you, when you in the New Testament, begin to look at the book of Acts, and you look at Acts chapter 2, you see that on the day of Pentecost, that there were Jews from various nations who were there to celebrate that great feast. And so, when you read through chapter 2 in the book of Acts, 16 nations are spoken of that have Jews who have come from those nations to celebrate in Jerusalem this particular feast. And so, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit falls on the 12, or on the apostles and the 120, when the Holy Spirit falls upon them and they go out and begin to proclaim the great works of God and magnifying Him, you see these people from foreign lands who see the evidence of the presence of God on these people and they begin to, some begin to mock them, they're filled with new wine. And the Apostle Peter stands up and speaks and says, no, these are not drunken as you suppose. It's too early in the morning for that to take place. He says, but this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel, who said, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And what he does is he preaches what is called the Pentecost sermon. So at that time, you see God once again like a prefigurement of what's going to take place in the yet future. But what happens is the Romans in A.D. 70 come, and they destroy Jerusalem, and they scatter the Jewish people throughout the world. And so once again, they were dispersed. And so their initial regathering is only a beginning of what, what God wants to do in the future. And so you see them being regathered from Babylonian captivity. They remain in the land. You see the Romans in A.D. 70 coming and dispersing them throughout the world. 
And then you see in our lifetime the miracle of the nation of Israel. And I've spoken of this many times. I don't have to speak about it now. But when they became a nation in 1948, it was an amazing reality that a people who had been scattered throughout the world with no home of their own had been brought back to the land that belonged to them by promise. And that this nation began as a small regathering, but even as we'll see later on in the book of Ezekiel, it's as God has brought this body together, but it still has no breath of life in it. And that's not going to take place until the millennial reign of Christ after the tribulation. We'll see that in just a moment. But God is saying that he's going to bring them back. And in contrast to the false shepherds, God says, I will take care of you. That's what he's saying in verse 15 when he says, I will feed my flock and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I'm going to take care of you and I'm going to make sure that you're cared for in a proper way. This reminds us of what the psalmist in Psalm 23 says in verses 1 and 2 when he says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. And God is saying, as your shepherd, I will feed you. As your shepherd, I will make you to lie down. In other words, you shall be at peace and I will care for you. In verse 16, I will seek what was lost and bring back what was driven away. Bind up the broken, strengthen what was sick. But I will destroy the fat and the strong and feed them in judgment. God is going to seek, God is going to bring back, and God is going to bind up. Those who have grown fat, what's that mean? Those who have taken advantage of the others, and while the others don't have enough, have made sure that they are more supplied than the rest. Congress, the Senate. No, I'm just kidding. That's not them. I just think of them when I see that. Those who take care of themselves first. Those who are caring only, he says, I'm going to deal with you. You know, in the, in the Old Testament, you might find this interesting when you see the word fat. Sometimes it's speaking of, of one who's been blessed by God. In this particular case, what he's saying is you have taken advantage of the people to the point where you have had more than you need and others have had less than they should have. And I will take care of those who have taken care of themselves. I will deal with them and I will bring them into judgment. And that's what he's saying in verse 16. He said, feed them in judgment. Now, as we look at this, I have to say something more, a little bit more to give you some background. This is going to take place. What we're seeing in chapter 34, and this is, this is, this is what you call meat. So I hope, I hope I can give it to you in such a way that you're willing to hear it and receive it. This is called meat, the meat of the word. Because this is some theological implications that you have to have a background to kind of like be able to put it in its proper place. But what we're having here is something that's referred to that will take place in what is called the kingdom age. It's also called the millennial reign of Christ. The millennial reign of Christ. The word millennial speaks of a thousand year, a thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. So this, what we're seeing here in chapter 34 is prophetic in that it is speaking of events that will take place in the yet future. When you read your New Testament, you're able to discover that what is taking place is going to happen after what is called the tribulation. When you study the Bible and you look in the New Testament, you see that God says that he's going to pour out a time of wrath that's seven years that's called the wrath of the Lamb. It's also called the tribulation. Jesus speaks of it in Matthew 24 as tribulation and great tribulation. You see the same kind of prefigurement in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27 in various passages in Scripture that relate to this time where God is pouring out his wrath. The book of Revelation especially speaks concerning this from chapters 6 through 19. It's this period of time in the future that is called the tribulation, the great tribulation. That great tribulation period, that last seven years, will come to a conclusion. What's taking place here is in reference to the events after that, that is called the millennial reign or the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ. What this is, is the fulfillment of God's promise that he made to David, as we've been looking in 2 Samuel. 
And remember with me, those of you who've been with me on Sunday morning, how that in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 16, God had spoken and said, your house, your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. And so what God is speaking of in Ezekiel 34 goes all the way back to 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 16. And it's speaking concerning God fulfilling his promise. Now, this time that is called the millennial reign of Christ is not simply found in the book of Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 7. It's found throughout the Old Testament. It's, it's spoken of in Psalm 72, Isaiah 11, Isaiah 24, Isaiah 30, Isaiah 44, Isaiah 60, Isaiah 65, Jeremiah 33. You see it in Matthew 25. Romans chapter 8. You see this throughout the Old and into the New Testament, this thousand-year reign, this reign of Messiah. And Jeremiah 23, verses 5 and 6 says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved. Israel will dwell safely. This is his name by which he will be called, the Lord our righteousness. And so what's being spoken of here is what is going to take place during the millennial reign of Christ, who is also referred to as the Lord our righteousness. Now, continuing on and showing you what's going to take place, verse 17, as for you, O my flock, thus says the Lord God, behold, I shall judge between sheep and sheep, between rams and goats. Is it too little for you to have eaten up the good pasture? that you must tread down with your feet the residue of your pasture and to have drunk of the clear waters that you must foul the residue with your feet? And as for my flock, they eat what you have trampled with your feet. They drink what you have fouled with your feet. Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, behold, I myself will judge between the fat and the lean sheep because you have pushed with side and shoulder, butted all the weak ones with your horns and scattered them abroad. Therefore, I will save my flock. They shall no longer be a prey, and I will judge between sheep and sheep. Now, God is saying, I have dealt with the false prophets. I will also deal with the abusers or the abusive people within the confines of the nation. And in doing so, what he's saying here is, I will discern their true spiritual life, their true spiritual state. You see, during the uh, history of, of, of the believer, the history in the old as well as the new, you have people who show up, and we've already seen this in Ezekiel, who portray themselves as God's people. We already saw that in chapter 33, where he said, you sit before me as if you're my people. And, and, and you, 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 you're not my people because you hear, but you don't do. And so what we've had in, in history, you've always had people who are, are on the outside, they look really righteous, and, but in the inside, they're far from God. In Jesus' time, he used as a great example those that he, that he spoke of who were the Pharisees. And we know about the Pharisees, the separated ones, the the ones, he said, who will strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. He said, you're the ones who are like whitewashed tombs. You're beautiful on the outside, but on the inside, you're filled with decay and dead men's bones, filled with rottenness. You look good on the outside because you stand on street corners and you pray or you disfigure your face so it's seen by men that you're fasting or you give your gifts in such an ostentatious way as people will see you doing that and think you're righteous. But in reality, you speak with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. So Jesus spoke concerning this religious hypocrisy. And so what God is simply saying here is he's saying that there are people within the confines of that which is a religious institution or a people that should be called by my name. He says, but the bottom line is, is there are some who are, are there, but who are not the real thing. They're not the real thing. That will even take place at the end. And so these are the ones that you see in Matthew 25. When Jesus speaks concerning the judgment of the sheep and the goats. And so the sheep and the goats, when you look at Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46, and he speaks concerning this, you see that the sheep are the ones who actually cared about the poor. They're the ones who visited those who were in jail. They were the ones who, who were aware of the needs of people, especially his people. And they're the ones who went out and did things for them and cared for them, especially during the tribulation. 
There are going to be some apparently who make it through who have the appearance of being the real thing, but God is saying, no, I'm going to judge it. I'll make sure that because I can read the heart. Other people can't, but I can. You see, the bottom line is, is that none of us obviously know who's really saved and who's not. And that might sound kind of like an astounding thing for you to hear me say. You might say, no, wait a minute. No, my brother is really loves the Lord. My aunt really loves the Lord. Mom really, you know, but the bottom line is, is only God really knows who's really saved and who's not. Only God does. There are a lot of people I've met over the years who have every outside appearance of loving the Lord when in reality their, their, their profession of faith is short-lived. All you have to do is live for a while. When you're first saved, you know, I was 20. When I was first saved and all these people were with me and all these people that, that, um, that I was hanging around with were saying, oh, I love the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to serve him all the days of my life. I would look to them as spiritual leaders for the first three months of my life until I went into the army. And uh, now I can tell you this Sunday it'll be 39 years. My anniversary of coming to Christ is this Sunday and 39 years. I can tell you over 39 years that there have been a number of people in my life who I at one time would have argued with you hammer and tongue, this person loves the Lord, who have walked away from God never to return, never to even remember sometimes that they even had a professing walk with Jesus Christ. So you really don't know, only God does. See, so it's not my job to judge. I, I don't have the ability to, nor do I have the calling to. I'm not the judge, only God truly really knows. Because there have been times in my life, probably the same with you in yours, where if you'd have seen the fruit of my life at that moment, you'd have said, this guy needs Jesus in the worst way. This guy is as lost as they come. And I've shared this with you before. It bears repetition at this point to illustrate. I can still remember going to one of my cousin's wedding. My cousin was born again. I'd been in the military, got out of the army, went to her wedding. I was about 22 years old at the time. I went to her wedding. And while I was there, they were offering free champagne. And I said, well, I'm over 21. I can have a glass or two, or three, a bottle. Before you know it, I was, I was pretty buzzed. We used to call it buzz. I don't know what it's called now. I was drunk. And I was sitting there in the, in the front room, and I was just trying to maintain. I was trying to get my bearings because I, I had been drinking and, uh, you know, that champagne and some beer too. And a Christian guy sits down next to me, because my, my cousin's born again, still walking with the Lord to this day. Now, a Christian guy sits down next to me and starts witnessing to me, starts telling me about Jesus. And I'm looking at him, and I'm drunk. And I'm saying, I, I, know, I know him. I'm born again. And he's looking at me, yeah, well, you know the Lord can save you, and the Lord, and I'm going, yeah, yeah, I, I, I know that, yeah. And I, I'll never forget that. I was as drunk as a skunk, we used to say. I was drunk. And then when he walks away, I still remember saying this to him. He said, well, I'll him, I, uh, he says to me, I'll, I'll talk to you again sometime. And I said, yeah, here, there, or in the air, because that's what we used to say, here, there, or in the air. And he looks at me. I mean, I had the cliches down. Now, was I saved? Yeah, I was saved. Was I acting as one who was saved? No, I wasn't. I was living in the flesh. I was living in the flesh. So if you saw me at that time, you'd say, this guy doesn't know the Lord. This brother in the Lord was, was sure I was a new Christian. I was a backslider. You see, the difference between someone who doesn't know the Lord and a backslider is someone who doesn't know the Lord doesn't care that they're drunk. As a matter of fact, they enjoy it. That's why they drank. The believer, on the other hand, grieves the Holy Spirit, quenches the Spirit, and senses conviction and repents and says, God, be merciful to me. I am a sinner, Lord. And that's exactly what I did. God, forgive me. What a lousy Christian I have been. And I, it wasn't much after that that I got my life in order with the Lord. But you never know who's saved and who's not saved because you can see some people who are just so outwardly got it all together that you are absolutely sure this person is saved, when in reality, they're not at all. They're just a good person. They're just a nice person. They don't swear. They don't steal. They're, they honor their vows to their wives or husband. They're just nice people. But they don't have a relationship with God. So you don't know. And even if they said, I do have a relationship, you don't know. Only God knows. So the Lord is the one who's able to make those judgments. And so I have a tendency of just trusting him to make that judgment. And God has a tendency of doing that. He's the one who does. 
The Lord Jesus Christ is ultimately the one who separates the sheep from the goats. In Matthew 25, verses 31 through 33, it says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him. He will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. He will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. And so he's the one who makes that judgment. Now he says in verse 23, I will establish one shepherd over them and he shall feed them, my servant David. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God. My servant David, a prince among them, I, the Lord, have spoken. Now, the common understanding of these verses that we just looked at, verses 23 and 24, is that this is a picture of Messiah. It, it speaks of the one who comes from David's line, the one who comes from David's dynasty, all the way back again to 2 Samuel chapter 7. But the whole point he's making is that people will know that God indeed is the true God, and that's what he's saying. He's saying, I, the Lord, have spoken. He goes on and says in verse 25, I will make a covenant of peace with them and cause wild beasts to cease from the land. They will dwell safely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. I will make them and the places all around my hill a blessing. I will cause showers to come down in their season. There shall be showers of blessing. Then the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. The earth shall yield her increase. They shall be safe in their land, and they shall know that I am the Lord when I've broken the bands of their yoke and delivered them from the hand of those who enslaved them. And they shall no longer be a prey for the nations, nor shall beasts of the land devour them. They shall dwell safely. No one shall make them afraid. I will raise up for them a garden of renown, and they, will, they shall no longer be consumed with hunger in the land, nor bear the shame of the Gentiles anymore. Thus they shall know that I, the Lord their God, am with them, and they, the house of Israel, are my people, says the Lord God. You are my flock, the flock of my pasture. You are men, and I am your God, says the Lord God. I will make a covenant of peace with them. So God is speaking concerning the fact that they're going to have a relationship with him that results in peace. Now, if you take notes, Jeremiah Chapter 31 says this in verses 31 through 34. Listen to what it says. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds, write it on their hearts, and I will be their God. They shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. When the Lord Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning, the people are going to have a relationship with God. And what is interesting is that God says that I'm going to write my covenant on the tablets of their heart. I'm going to bring them into a place where I can write on the tablets of their heart. In the New Testament, we saw that fulfilled. You see, when you and I committed our hearts to Christ, that law that we have here in this Bible, that law that we read from the pages of this book, the law that speaks concerning you shall do this and you shall not do that, this law that we will read and we will say, you know, God's word says thus and so. Well, in, in, in one sense of the word, that law is, is outside of us because it's on the page of this book. But when you get saved, God takes that word and he writes it on the tablets of your heart. And so now you have a new heart, you have a new life, you have a new way of thinking because that comes from the word of God. And it's not simply an instinctual thing, by the way. It's as you read the Word of God, God's Word begins to read you. As you begin to meditate on that Word, as you begin to practice that Word, as you begin to, to ask God to give you insights into His Word, as you make a uh, decision to obey that Word, as you put it into practice and see Jesus Christ manifesting Himself to you, then you grow, and you grow from being an infant. You grow into being a, a, a young person, you know, young man or young woman. And ultimately, you become a father or a mother of the faith. And that takes time over a lifetime. 
So don't be discouraged if you're young right now in the things of the Lord and you're growing because over time, it's just one day at a time. It's one week at a time. It's one month at a time. And, and as that takes place, you're just adding to and you're adding to and you're adding to. And the more you know and the more that you do, the more God manifests himself. And now you begin to grow in your understanding of the ways of the Lord. And this is because those things have been written on the tablets of your heart. And so there are times when, when there may be something that somebody's asking you if you'd like to do, and you'll be saying, you know, in your mind, you're saying, Lord, is it okay? Is it not okay? I just don't have a sense of peace. It may not be because you have a particular scripture in mind that comes, but you have a sense of the flavor of the word, and you know that if you do that, that they're asking you to do, or go that place that they're asking you to go, that's probably not the best thing for you. And, and that all comes because you're in love with the Lord, and you desire to do His will. And so that's how that works. And God has written his law on the tablet of your heart. And from the inside, you begin to do those things that are pleasing to him. When you first get saved, as you're reading the word of God, it's such a revelation. And you begin to see that God has a certain spirit that he wants me to, to have and to walk in. I remember when I first got saved, I had a, a guy, I was, again, I was 20 years old. I came out of a drug background. And uh, I had a guy telling me, and I was a brand new believer. I hadn't been saved more than two weeks to a month. He was saying to me, there's nothing wrong with smoking pot. He wasn't a Christian. And I said, no, I don't think I'm supposed to do that anymore. No, wait a minute. God made the herbs. That was his argument. We used to call pot herb. He said, God made the herbs, man, you know, and it's good. And I said, you know, I don't think so. And he says, well, where's the Bible say I can't smoke marijuana? You see, that's what people do. You know that. I know that. Where does it say specifically that I can't do this? And... Uh, what you have is you can have some specific commands that are called in Scripture commands of God. So you can have specific commands, but you also have what is called the spirit of the word. And so you may have a specific command, thou shalt not, that you can appeal to. But when somebody speaks to you and says, well, words that say I can't smoke pot, there's the spirit of the word. I'm not supposed to yield myself to the control of any agency outside of the power of the Spirit of God through the Word of God. And when I yield myself to smoke and pot, I'm yielding myself over to something that, that is going to control me the way I think and the things that I do. And it's similar to when I, if I yield myself to alcohol and I give myself over to that and I drink to excess, I get drunk, I'm under the control of that, of that substance. That's why the scripture says, and be not drunk with wine, which is dissipation or uh, a lack of, of self-control, but rather be filled with the spirit. So rather than the spirit of alcohol, if you will, you're to be filled with the spirit of God. And so the same would hold true in principle with yielding myself to a, a drug substance with the intention of getting loaded because I'm yielding myself over to that. Now, I didn't have a scripture. Now, in the book of Galatians chapter 5, it speaks concerning sorcery. And the word sorcery, the Greek word is pharmakeia. It's where we get the word pharmaceuticals from. Pharmaceuticals speak of drug use. It was used in the act of sorcery. But drug use was intended to create another kind of consciousness. And so the sorcerers would take drugs so that they could pronounce certain things. And so I can now point to Galatians 5 and say, that's the work of the flesh, it's pharmakia. I'm not to have anything to do with that. In the book of Revelation, it says the sorcerers are outside of the kingdom. And therefore, I'm not to yield that myself to that. I can now defend my position through Scripture. But at that time, God had just written on the tablets of my heart, this isn't right. This isn't right. And that's what he does. And that's the promise, guys. So many times you may have a sense, mm, I shouldn't do that, but I don't have a particular scripture for it. That may very well be the Holy Spirit warning you and saying, because this doesn't please me. And God says, I'm going to write on the tablets of your heart. I'm going to make a covenant peace with you. This would refer back to Jeremiah 31 and how God said, I will do this work in you. Now, 
as I rush to a conclusion here, verse 25, when he says, I will make a covenant of peace with them and cause wild beasts, etc. This is speaking of the millennial reign. The earth is going to be peaceful again. It's going to be like in the beginning of creation. You know, when in Isaiah 11, it says, with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he'll give decisions for the poor of the earth. He'll strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt. And faithfulness, the sash around his waist. The wolf will, li will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together. And a little child will lead them. You know, have you ever been to the zoo? Perhaps you have. And you see these lions, they're, they're beautiful and they're, 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 they're majestic. But man, I'm not going to lie down next to one of those things. You know, and lying down with one of the things that it normally eats is giving us a picture of the peace that you have in the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's going to be a time, in other words, when Jesus is ruling and reigning in his millennial kingdom, that these animals that we have a natural fear of and that have a fear of us and that would look at us as being prey, there's going to be a time when we're actually going to be able to hang around with them without fear. And I think that's going to be cool. I have to be honest with you. I think it would be so cool to be around the tigers and all of those things. I really do. I think, man, it's going to be cool to be able to go and pet one of those things and, and come back with my hand. I mean, I think that's going to be a great thing. And so that's the picture of the Lord because they're not going to devour us. They're not going to be after us. They're not going to be our enemies anymore. This is in the kingdom of righteousness when the Lord Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning. He says in verse 26, I'll make them and the places all around my hill a blessing. When he speaks of my, my hill, he's speaking of the city of Jerusalem, Mount Zion. I'm going to cause showers to come down in their season. There'll be showers of blessing. In the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, it speaks of how that God is going to take the children of Israel from Egypt, where Egypt had this main water source, the Nile, that was used for irrigation and all drinking purposes. And God says, and I'm going to take you to a land that really doesn't have a main water source like that. It actually has a Jordan. So you're going to rely on the early and the latter rain. And so I, when I bring the early rain and the latter rain, whenever you have the rain come, you are going to be able to thank me because I'm providing for you so that you can actually survive in the land that I'm giving to you. So we know that the, that the rain that God spoke of in the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 11, that rain that he speaks of is speaking of his grace because the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 5 verse 45 said that God sends rain on the just and the unjust. And so when God is saying here that there will be showers of blessing. When he speaks about rain, he's speaking about my grace. My grace is going to be just overflowing when you're there in this kingdom. It's going to be a place where the Lord Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning and his grace is pouring down upon us. The trees of the field are going to yield their fruits. There's not going to be any need. You're not going to have hunger. You're not going to have strife. You're not going to have any of those things. You're not going to be enslaved by anything anymore. You're not going to be, according to verse 28, a, a prey for the nations. And so you're going to be living at nothing but peace. You're not going to need to have locks on your doors and you're not going to have to lock your car when you drive. You're not going to have any of those things. You're probably not going to have a car either. But you're not going to have any concern in that way at all. When he says in verse 29, I will raise up for them a garden of renown, he's going to provide for them in every way. Our physical needs will be completely met. And what is interesting, and I need to point this out, in verse 29, the last portion he says, nor bear the shame of the Gentiles anymore. Now, what an interesting phrase that is. I'm going to be blessing you in the reign of Messiah in every way, shape, and form. I will seek you out. I will find you. I will regather you. I will be your king. You will have your shepherd over you, Jesus Messiah. He will provide for you in every way, shape, and form. And you will not bear the shame of the Gentiles anymore. One of my commentators, and I think this is true, that's why I'm repeating it, said that this speaks of the taunts that anti-Semitic people have made concerning the Jews throughout their history, which we still have, of course, to this day, where people use phrases that are anti-Semitic, even phrases that they think are just sayings that are actually greatly offensive and, and extremely painful to Jewish people. When we stereotype and when you call them names, and that's what he's saying. He's saying the Gentiles have taunted you. The Gentiles have used words in, in reference to you that has been painful to you. And no longer will that be true. You will no longer bear the taunts of the Gentiles. And then finally, he says, verse 30, they shall know that I, the Lord their God, am with them. And they, the house of Israel, are my people, says the Lord God. You 
are my flock, the flock of my pasture. You are men. I am your God, says the Lord God. I have a love for you that is unbreakable. And those who embrace him through faith in his son Jesus are his people. It is not an automatic. Jesus makes that very clear that we need to have faith in him. John the Baptist, when he was baptizing, people said, don't think to say within yourself, we are sons of Abraham, for I say unto you that God is able of these rocks to raise up unto himself children of Abraham. What was he saying? He's saying, don't think that you through inheritance are automatically, simply because you are genetically Jewish, don't think that you are automatically part of the promises of God. Because we're told in, in Romans chapter 4, verse 3, uh, Abraham believed God. It was accounted unto him as righteousness. You see, there's no automatic salvation. These whom he's referring to are those who have committed themselves to Messiah. They are not automatically, simply because they are ethnically Jewish, they, they are not automatically his children. God is speaking concerning those who have yielded themselves over to him in faith. These are the ones that he's blessing. These are the ones that he's caring for. These are the ones that he refers to as being his flock, the flock of his pasture. These are the ones that he says, you are men, but I am your God. And so that's how you and I entered into this relationship with God in the first place, is through faith. Even as Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him as righteousness, even so, we were not born into faith. We were not baptized into faith. We personally embrace Christ through faith and by the grace of God receive salvation as a result of that. We were not naturally his children. We had to receive him, even as John says, but as to as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become sons of God, even unto those who believe on his name. And so what we did is we heard the message of the gospel. We said, God, be merciful to me. I am a sinner. Forgive me. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross. You were buried and you rose from the dead. I believe that. And now I ask you to forgive me my sins because you came to do that, to be my savior. I believe you. I trust you. And as a result of that, I'm born again. And I'm a child of God. That's how it works.